but it well, was. Well, today, but okay. Okay. Um, why do I advocate the sideways movement and the Venus Project? Okay. Whenever we uh, back up something or, dis or take a decision on something, it's because of our experience. So I'm just going to talk about a little bit of my background and what brought me to um, advocating for this movement. I was born in a city in Mexico, Monterrey. I don't know if any of you. Yeah. This is Monterrey. Uh, I was born here in the sides of the mountain. Um, while I, when I was little, we were okay. We were doing okay in, in the financial world, you might say. I went to a good school. Um, but then there was a crisis going on in Mexico at that time. So my parents had a very difficult time. We had to move something else because whenever you go into a crisis of uh, humanity, you have to take a, a decision, like a fight or flight situation. You enter into that. So my parents took the flight part of, of this stressful moment. So we moved to Houston, Texas. Here in Houston, Texas, um, it was very different for me. It was a cultural shock, you might say, as, as, along with uh, a very different type of world to what I was used to. It was in a comfortable zone. I had everything I needed. But here we came as immigrants now speaking the language. Uh, my parents had to do, over there in Mexico, they were my dad was a dietitian at a hospital. My mom was a nurse at a hospital. Here, they did not have the credentials of already transferred to, to live in this uh, society or you know, what they asked for. So they had to take the lowest jobs. My mom had to uh, work at a hotel cleaning. My dad had to clean uh, the movie theaters. And well, some people had to take us during the night also because they were night hours. And I remember sleeping over in the video game section. So to me, it was very, very different. So I saw like the both sides of, of this monetary system when you're up, when you're down, down many times in my life. But, but I also went to school and I it was very different for me because this is a cosmopolitan city where I, in my uh, school there was Chinese, Japanese, um, Australian, Egyptian, I remember. And I was the only Hispanic in my classroom. So it, it was a very diverse classroom. I learned a lot, I remember. I learned the, the Chinese numbers, I learned the Japanese numbers from my friends. Okay. And I also learned how to play the piano from a Chinese friend I had. I never really studied music. I learned it from, from here and there. Okay. And then my parents, they were very well thinkers. <laughs> they suddenly decided they would like the city of Houston anymore. So we moved down to Mexico again, but now we went to a, a small ranch called Dr. Arroyo. They were um, now into uh, kind of helping missionary in the spirit. <laughs> so we went to this place. And I met another type of people, very different um, from what I had seen. Very calm, very simple, humble. But everywhere I went, I, also, I always saw people suffering, always wanting something. Whether it was in a big city, or whether it was in Mexico, wherever, there was always suffering everywhere. So I asked myself why. I'm a very observer person, and I always ask a lot of questions, and I, I was asked why. Then we moved back to the U.S. for some reason. I don't know. My parents would just like to move home. So and we came here to to Macau, and well, we went. Well, actually, we lived in Mission, and in the school I was at, there was a lot of gang members. And they were always mad, right? I didn't understand why they were mad, but I mean, they just like to look mad and intimidate people for some reason. I just try to smile to the man. But, and I also saw what, that people were always moving, just like us, but trying to run away from something, immigrating, and not only here to the US, all over the world. And that always happened. Um, but why? Why so much of this flight? And those that cannot move from where they're at, they just abandon themselves where they're at. Mama. And I saw that everywhere I went. Mama. And then I started to think, why do people 
move from Latin America, if it's such a rich uh, in natural resource place, it's got everything. It's got everything. Why is this place one of the most uh, immigrant uh, um, producers if it has everything? Papa. And then I started to, why is the if it's a place with so much richness and natural resources, why does it have the highest poverty rate? And not only um, Latin America, but also you see it from other continents where they're also very rich in, in natural resources, but they have the greatest poverty rate. It's paradoxical, it doesn't really match. So what's going on? Why, again? And then when I realized about the Zygat movement, I heard about it, everything started to make sense. It's because of the game. It's because of this game that we're in, that you have to follow these rules to be the winner. And everybody wants to be the winner, but only one can be the winner for a lot of losers around it. It's not a good game if everybody wins. It just doesn't make sense in this monetary system. So I started to realize, well, yeah. Now it really starts to make sense if you follow this game, that's how it works. So is it a fair game? I don't think so. And then my mom always told me, don't eat in front of, of people that are hungry. And I asked my mom, why, why is that, right? Is there a consequence to that when you eat in front of hungry people? Or can you just feel, why do you feel bad about it? Why? And then I came back to Monterrey after all this flying everywhere. We went back to Monterrey. Well, actually, I, I, we went back and then my family left me there. <laughs> and I didn't want to move anymore, so I stayed there. Because I was already going into college. I wanted to study medicine because um, I always wanted to study music. But because of this game, there's not that much money in music. That's what you hear from your parents and from your relatives. So, no, mijita, don't study music. Se mueren de hambre. They die of hunger. You need to study something more stable. Okay, I also like to help people. I might as well study medicine. Okay, so I did. And in this um, city, there's rich and poor living together. But are they happy? And then I started to observe that the poor people were always complaining to the government, but they were never heard. They were just there, abandoned, and making their houses however they could. They're not even painted because they do not have the money for it. And this particular region is in the center of Monterrey. It's called Colonia Independencia. It's at the very center of Monterrey. But then, right, this is Independencia right here, but right across a little hill, you've got the richest part of Monterrey, which is one of the richest part of Mexico, San Pedro. And it's not, this is all San Pedro, and San Pedro is all, 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 also here, but there's just like a little, a little street that divides the most poor from the most rich. So it's very, very contradicting, and, but the city managed to flow that way. The rich didn't look down to the poor, but the poor were always looking at the rich. The poor always had this dream that this society created in them. It, this is sort of deck, it's like a lottery where they do there in Monterrey, and you see a bunch of poor people always buying their ticket because they all want their share. I remember once there was a, the UN, um, Committee, the UN, uh, United Nations, uh, went to Monterrey to have their conference there. And I remember the president wanting to cover this part of Monterrey, the Independencia, with just, uh, just a banner, a big banner, with pretty pictures, so that the rest of the world of leaders would not see this. So. And, well, this is just a song that talks about how 
the queen, the Olympia Virus is the, the little kid that's always cleaning, always cleaning the, I want to do Always, always cleaning the windshields, right? And we managed to always ignore that person or get away. It's already green, I need to go. But do you really think that, that there's no effect on that person that is trying to clean your window? Everything you do, even if it's not intentional, whatever you, whatever you act, whatever your body language has an effect. Sooner or later, it has an effect. And there was also, I saw this video of this kid, he, he is a malabarista, how do you say? Juggler. A juggler, there in the streets of Monterrey. And he is talking there that he gets paid around $30 a day for what, I mean, whatever he collects, right? And that he likes it. Okay. I would like to juggle too, right? But he doesn't go to school. He dropped out at uh, fourth grade. And he's always there uh, in the street lights looking at these great cars, when right? all types of cars stop by. Some might give him something. Some others will just tell him to move away, just like they do to this one right here. And we just think that that was the way it was, because it, they have always been there in our society, being ignored and oppressed. And then I finished, I graduated, I became a doctor there in my country. And I started to work. <coughs> and then when I was working, I said, finally, yes, I'm gonna make some money. I'm gonna get into this game, right? But in Mexico, when you're a, a recent graduate and start work, the, the visit, the doctor visit, it's only 20, 20 pesos, which is less than $2, okay? It is very, very <laughs> contradicting with this society over here where you go to the doctor and he charges $100. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's, it was very, it didn't make sense to me. Nor that one or this one. There should be something in between, right? So it's perfect for the community. I mean, you need uh, health access, you've got it over there in Mexico, but also the doctor needs to be healthy too. <laughs> with, 20, uh, with 20 pesos, with $2 per visit, and when you have a family, it's not really, it's not really enough. So, but it was, there was a catch for this. It was because um, for this in the hospital that I worked for, they had um, their main profit was in, in the imaging of uh, technology services. For example, CAT scans, uh, ultrasounds, all of that. So they told me, no, Dr. you see, whenever you get a patient who's got a headache, Send them to a CT scan, right? and you'll get your your good money from that. Okay, and if they come with a belly ache and it might be an appendicitis, maybe it's not an urgent thing right now, or or something other. I don't know, cholecystectomy, something, right? Let's get them into surgery, and you'll get your your share. So I really didn't, I didn't really abide to that. So I didn't like it that much. So I moved to another place to work. And I started working at the, at the clinic for the municipal, in the Clinica Municipal at Santa Catarina, okay, where I used to attend the, the policemen and everybody that worked for, for, the, for the county, you might say, not the county, the... The, the municipality. Yeah, the municipality. So I, I served the, mainly uh, the police. And they went there, but while I was there working, the, the violent flow was starting to arise in, in my city. And I remember the, my patients that would, go, that would go, they wanted uh, disability because they were killing one policeman per day because of the drug cartel thing and all of that. And they wanted disability. They would say, doctor, please, um, I got diarrhea, I got this, I got the hypertension, I need a few days. And not, even, not just them, I also attended the higher ones in, 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 in the municipality. And because there was bomb threats, and it, it, my, the main um, consult was because of stress-related diseases. Okay. And the violence just got worse and worse until it reached something like this.
very downtown in Monterrey. And this is every day right now in Monterrey and other cities of northern Mexico. Um, it's just getting worse and worse. And 